Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to this lecture. My name is Professor Andrew Timming and I want to extend a very warm welcome to you for joining me today. The content of today's lecture will focus on a multivariate statistical technique entitled factor analysis. Uh, sometimes it's called factor analysis, uh, other times it's called principal components analysis. Uh, but today, just for purposes of simplicity, we will refer to this as factor analysis. So this is a multivariate technique similar to some of the other multivariate techniques we've looked at so far in the book, uh, but it has a very interesting distinguishing feature. And that's that with this particular multivariate technique, we are not trying to predict anything. We're not trying to explain uh, a relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. Factor analysis takes a completely different uh, approach to uh, data analysis. And essentially what it's doing is data reduction. Okay, so uh, this lecture corresponds to chapter 11 of the textbook that we're using for this course, which you can see in the following slide. This, as always, is the textbook that we're using for this course. It's entitled Applied Statistics, Business and Management Research, and uh, it was written by me. Before you proceed in this lecture, I would urge you to press pause if you have not already read chapter 11. Uh, by reading the textbook, you'll have a much better understanding of some of the concepts that I will explain to you throughout this lecture. Okay, uh, let's dive right into factor analysis, get a sense of what factor analysis is and how social scientists or data scientists might be able to use factor analysis in their research. Let's begin. Starting with the most fundamental question, what is factor analysis? Let's spend a few moments having a look at how we might answer this question. So uh, let's review some of the statistical tests that we've looked at so far in this book. We've looked at the t-test, which compares means across two scores. We've looked at the ANOVA, the analysis of variance, which compares means across three or more uh, scores. And we've also looked at chi-square tests, which compares two nominal variables with each other. And we've looked at simple regression and Pearson's R. So those are the bivariate tests that we've looked at. And then in terms of the multivariate tests that we've looked at, we've gone through simple, reg we've gone through multiple regression as well as logistic regression. And a common theme uh, across all of these tests that we've looked at so far is that we've been trying to predict a dependent variable from either one independent variable or a set of independent variables. So we've always made the distinction between the independent variable as the predictor and the dependent variable as the outcome. That's not what we're doing in factor analysis, right? So factor analysis takes a completely different approach. There are no independent variables and there are no dependent variables in the context of factor analysis. Instead, what we're trying to do is to discover whether or not a set of variables share the underlying, the same underlying structure with one another. Or another way of describing this is we want to find out if a set of variables hang together nicely, right? So if they share uh, enough in common that they might be measuring some wider super variable, we might call it. So factor analysis, like the other ones, like multiple regression and logistic regression, is also a multivariate method. But as I said, it doesn't distinguish between 
dependent and independent variables. Of course, you could apply uh, factor analysis to a set of variables that may subsequently become independent variables in another method, or equally, you could apply factor analysis to a set of variables that may become a dependent variable in another type of technique. But in and of itself, factor analysis isn't concerned with cause and effect uh, relationships with independent variables affecting dependent variables. Probably the best way to gain an understanding of what factor analysis is, is through an example. Okay, and we'll start with the example of trying to measure a construct like job satisfaction. So how satisfied an individual is with his or her job. Now let's say that we have administered a survey and the survey that we've administered has four variables and these are all measured using some kind of Likert scale. So you remember Likert scale is something like uh, agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree, right? Those types of items. So the items that we've measured in this survey are uh, number one, I'm satisfied with my pay. You can think about that for a second. Does that seem to tap into the wider concept of job satisfaction? Probably. Number two, I'm satisfied with the amount of decision making that I have. Does that tap into the wider concept of, concept of job satisfaction? Probably. Number three, I'm committed to my job. Now, is commitment a measure of job satisfaction? It's clearly related to job satisfaction, but the question we're asking now is, is it job satisfaction? Right? So if you're committed to your job, you're probably also likely satisfied. Uh, similarly, I have a good relationship with my manager. Is that an indicator of job satisfaction or is that a correlate of job satisfaction? So what we do with factor analysis, let's say we have these four items, is we run an analysis and that analysis will look to see which of these items hang together and which of these items don't hang together. And you might find, for example, in a factor analysis that items one and two might correspond to factor A, we might call that uh, job satisfaction, and items three and four might correspond to a separate factor. So that's telling us that they don't necessarily hang together with the two job satisfaction items uh, in our survey. They may measure something else, whether that's uh, organizational commitment or something along those lines. So what the factor analysis would tell us in this case is that our four single item variables that we've actually measured are in fact measuring two separate underlying constructs. So what do I mean when I talk about an underlying construct or a wider construct than what we've measured in our survey? In order to understand this concept, you have to understand what we mean by a latent variable, right? So we have observable variables and we have latent variables. And this is a new concept for you. Uh, so far, every statistical test that we've done so far in this book and in this lecture series has used observable variables, but there are also a set of unobservable variables that we refer to as latent variables. So variables that we directly measure in the context of a survey or a questionnaire are what we call observable variables. Observable variables, meaning you can observe them, you can see them, and you can measure them directly. And the thing that observable variables all share in common is that they're always single item indicators, right? So if you have a survey and you have a question, right, that's one question, and that's referred to as a single item indicator. It's measuring something with just a single question or statement. Now, some observable variables and questionnaires are easy to measure, right? Relatively easy to measure. If you ask someone's age, how old are you? 
you don't need to ask different questions to get an answer at that. You only need one question, and that one question will give you a reasonably accurate answer. Well, you know, on occasion, someone might make a mistake uh, or you know, write down the wrong number, but it's easy to measure, generally speaking, uh, some observable variables like age. But others are more difficult to measure. Think about something like personality. Can you ask someone a single question and totally capture their personality? No, I don't think so. Personality is multidimensional. And because it's multidimensional, you probably need to use multiple single items in order to get an understanding of this wider construct. So the underlying constructs or factors that we identify among a set of single item indicators are what we call unobservable or latent variables, right? So unobservable mean we can't see them directly. We can only uh, see them indirectly or assume that they exist in relation to observable variables that we can observe, right? So latent variables can only be measured indirectly by means of a set of observable variables that somehow logically hang together. All right, so the next question is, how do we discover or how do we analyze these unobservable variables? If they don't uh, exist in a way that's observable, if we have to assume that they exist by virtue of their relation to single item indicators, how can we actually analyze and confirm that they exist? And the tool that we use to analyze latent variables is factor analysis. But there are two separate types of factor analysis. So the first type is what we call exploratory factor analysis. And the second type is what we call confirmatory factor analysis. So let's take a look at what these two types are. Starting with exploratory factor analysis. With exploratory factor analysis, we go into the analysis with no idea of what the underlying structure might look like. In other words, we have no idea of what types of factors might emerge from our analysis, what types of latent variables might exist in our data set. So to give you an example, let's say we have uh, 40 items in our survey. So these are 40 observable single item indicators. And what we want to do is just explore the possibility that within those 40 single item indicators, there may be latent variables hidden in there that we aren't able to see. So what this means is that we don't have any a priori assumptions about the underlying factor structure. We're just doing an exploratory factor analysis and asking if the analysis itself can potentially identify latent variables that we don't assume to exist in advance, right? So that's one method. The second is through confirmatory factor analysis, CFA. And confirmatory factor analysis is always based on a theory. So we look at existing theory and we think about among our 40 items based on theory, how they might hang together, how they might logically relate to each other. So we might assume, for example, in these 40 items that we actually have four latent variables or four uh, constructs, uh, wider constructs that exist. We don't know if this is the case and what we wanna do is test whether or not this is the case. So when we test it, a confirmatory factor analysis will tell us if we have a poor fit or a good fit in relation to our hypothesized four factor model. And the thing about confirmatory factor analysis is that it is confirmatory, that is to say you're testing an idea about the latent variables within your uh, questionnaire, but you can also follow up confirmatory uh, factor analysis with something called modification indices. And these modification indices, indices are kind of like a second step to confirmatory factor analysis where you can explore different variations of latent constructs within your data set. So the modification indices help you identify a better fitting model. Maybe your four-factor 
hypothesis was wrong and that there are in fact three factors in your 40 items or maybe even five factors in your 40 items. And these types of post hoc exploratory analysis can help you get at the bottom of the underlying structures in your data. So factor analysis is really widely used in management research, especially management researchers who are interested in the psychological aspects of management. So psychologists are the primary users of factor analysis. They've been measuring constructs like, for example, personality for centuries. Uh, one of the most common approaches to measuring personality is through the big five. So we have big five personality factors, including conscientiousness is a key one, openness to experience, uh, agreeableness, extroversion, and neuroticism. Now let's take one of these conscientiousness and let's ask how we might measure it. You could ask simply, do you consider yourself to be a conscientious person or are you conscientious? And someone could say yes or no, but that's not very helpful and that won't actually measure how conscientious an individual is. Maybe you could ask instead, to what extent are you conscientious on a scale of one to seven, where one is not at all conscientious and seven is extremely conscientious. This is probably a little bit better than the yes, no question, but it still doesn't capture the breadth and depth of the wider construct. The fact is that conscientiousness is a multi-dimensional construct in and of itself. It's made up of several lower order traits, for example, orderliness and impulse control and industriousness and reliability and conventionality among others. And each one of those traits could be measured in a number of ways as well. So each one of those sub traits could be uh, measured as a latent variable combining a set of single item indicators. So the point is there's many dimensions at play and what factor analysis does is it tells us how those variables fit together. All right, let's look at a few examples of how we might operationalize some research questions that could be asked and answered using factor analysis. So first question, what is the underlying structure of individual job performance, right? You could measure job performance with a single item indicator, right? It could simply be a case of a manager looking at an employee's job and saying, I score you a seven and I score you a two and I score you a five. But that single item measure of job performance might not be enough to fully capture that wider construct of job performance. And the reason is that job performance is a multifaceted construct. So another thing you might do beyond a single item indicator is to have multiple evaluations. You might have a managerial evaluation. You might ask coworkers to evaluate subordinates and customers, all of them evaluating performance as you might see in, for example, a 360 degree performance appraisal. Similarly, you might include hard performance data like sales alongside soft performance data like interpersonal achievements. The point is once you compile all of your indicators of performance, then a factor analysis can tell you whether you're dealing with one overall measure of performance, of job performance, or whether you're dealing with multiple factors, each of which contributes to or is associated with a wider latent job performance construct. Let's look at another example of a research question that might be asked and answered using factor analysis. What's the underlying structure of job satisfaction? Right, you could simply ask an employee how satisfied you are at work, but would that fully capture job satisfaction? The answer is probably no. And the reason is that what if someone is satisfied with some aspects of their job, but not with other aspects or dimensions? Based on this logic, in order to fully capture the construct of job satisfaction, you might have to combine multiple indicators. These include, for example, how satisfied you are with your pay, with the work itself, with your supervisory support, with opportunities for training and development, how satisfied you are with autonomy. And by combining all of these indicators together, a factor analysis will tell you if you're dealing with one factor uh, that latently measures job satisfaction or whether there are separate factors within your 
data set. So why would we want to use factor analysis? What's the, the logic here in uh, identifying latent variables from a set of observable variables? And the answer is that factor analysis helps us simplify and reduce our data, right? Simpler is generally better. We want to have the most parsimonious approach to data analysis as we possibly can. So what do I mean by simplification and data reduction? Let's say you have about 50 observable indicators, right? You administer a survey and it asks 50 questions or has 50 items that the individual responds to. If you run a factor analysis on those 50 items, you're going to get a result of either one to 50 factors, right? So if there's one factor, what that means is that all of those 50 items hang together. They all measure more or less the same thing, but perhaps different dimensions of it. So there's one underlying construct. Alternatively, if your factor analysis identifies no factors at all, then you'll end up with just 50 unique uh, single item indicators that, again, they may be related to each other, they may predict one another, but they don't measure the same thing. So confirmatory factor analysis, again, as I said before, means you have no a priori or theoretical reason to believe that some of them hang together, whereas exploratory factor analysis simply looks at the 50 items and tries to identify potential latent variables in there. But the important point here is that if we can treat some of the variables we've identified as latent, then we've reduced the dimensionality of the data. We no longer have 50 items. If we identify five factors, then we only have five items and we can treat each one of those variables as a latent variable rather than dealing with 50 single item indicators. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for listening to this introduction to factor analysis. I look forward to seeing you over at lecture two corresponding to chapter 11. Bye now.